Terry. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Louise Kennedy. I'm on the uh, Special Events Committee uh, along with Terry and uh, Chris McLaughlin, who, uh, who heads this. And, uh, uh, you know, we have so many interesting presentations week in and week out, and we really try to make them timely relative to what's going on in the world. And this could not be more timely, this presentation. We are pleased to have uh, Michael McHugh here. Michael has his own law practice at Falls Church, and he has spent uh, a lot of time, and particularly this past weekend, reading some of these um, cases that have come up relative to abortion, relative to guns, gun rights. And I'm not sure he's read the one that came out this morning yet, but um, he's really become, well, he is quite quite uh, interested and, and actually passionate about some of these issues. So we invited him here to give us his perspective and, and to answer your questions from a legal perspective on what is happening, why it's happening, and what are the implications moving forward. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Michael McHugh. Mike, Michael? Thank you, Louise. I appreciate that introduction. Um, you know, there's the, um, the old curse, may you live in interesting times, and I think we're there <laughs> in one way or the other. I do wish we were able to be together in person, that COVID didn't keep us apart like this, um, and because uh, obviously your energy is something that, that um, I would feed on. Uh, I'm glad to be addressing a learned group such as this. It um, makes for much more interesting discussion and keeps me on my toes. So a little background, I trained as an architect, and then after I realized the society values its lawyers more than its architects, I went back to um, law school and I became a, uh, a lawyer. I did probably my first six, seven years land use zoning and development with a large firm. I started my own firm in 1993, and right now I practice on what is known as collaborative family law, estate planning, estate administration, and LGBTQ issues. I would love to talk with you more about collaborative practice, but I think that would have to be another program since we have so much on our plate for today. Typically, I would not share much about my personal life when um, talking to a group, but I, I have to say that, that the Supreme Court decisions have been very personal in my life. Uh, I am an openly gay man. I've been partnered for 28 years. I was married in 2008 in California during that little window of opportunity between June when the Supreme Court in California authorized um, same-sex marriages to occur and November when Proposition 8 was passed and the right was taken away. Um, I can only say that it's very strange having your marriage voted on. There are three Supreme Court decisions out there that affect me directly. So the first thing I want to speak about is uh, Lawrence v. Texas, which was a 2003 case. Up until 2003, there were a number of states that had what were called sodomy laws. And these were, were felony level criminal charges. And for the most part, they would criminalize anything, any kind of, of intimate uh, sexual relations um, except those between a married man and woman. So same-sex relationships and same-sex um, consensual sex was considered sodomy and was punishable by five years in prison. Uh, it, it varied obviously from state to state. 2003, the Supreme Court overruled that. Uh, Justice Kennedy wrote the, the decision. And, um, but for those of you who are married, it did not strike down adultery laws, which are based on marriage as opposed to anything else. I, I will point out that until 2003, I could have been prosecuted for loving my husband. So that kind of puts an edge in your um, relationships. Fast forward to 2013 and the Windsor decision. This was brought by um, GLAD out of New England. And the uh, Supreme Court required the federal government to recognize uh, marriages if the states um, had authorized them. So let's take an example. Uh, there were people across the country who had been married, say, in California, where it was legal, or Massachusetts, where it was legal. But the feds were not recognizing their marriages. Windsor says, you're required to recognize the marriage if the state recognizes the marriage. And it had a lot of implications, but among them, for instance, 
it was the first time I was able to file a joint tax return. Up until that time, we had always filed separate tax returns, although my accountant might tell me that a separate tax return would be in my favor, but that's a different issue. Then we come to 2015, and, and I will say that in the 2013 dissent, uh, uh, Justice Scalia did a pretty good job of laying out the roadmap of how the decision in Windsor would lead to nationwide marriage, which then was exactly the road that, or the path that was followed in Obergefell v. Rogers, which came up in 2015. And that decision uh, seven years ago yesterday uh, recognized that um, same-sex marriages um, should be permitted and that to ban them was unconstitutional. So from a very personal perspective, all of my rights to be married, to not be treated as a criminal, to participate in the 1,103 federal rights that are granted to married couples, to have my relationship treated with dignity, all of these things stem from these comparatively recent decisions. And that is why I'm watching what the court's doing and I would um, not be honest if I didn't say I'm a little concerned. And a couple of disclaimers here. I'm not an expert on the Supreme Court. I'm not a history professor. Although if you are looking for a very interesting history professor to follow, um, Heather Cox Richardson provides an email every morning summarizing the events of the previous day from a political and historical perspective. I highly recommend that, that you consider getting on that list because she has some of the most informative and thought provoking comments. Uh, and, and I, well, I don't always enjoy reading them in the morning because it may not be a good way to start it, but they are something that I would not want to miss. And the other thing I want to add is I know who I'm talking to. I am pretty sure that among you, there are um, some of you who are far more knowledgeable than I am. When we get to the questions, I really look forward to hearing your thoughts on these cases um, and in your perspectives, because I think you have a lot to offer. One other disclaimer I will offer is that these issues are inherently political at some level, and they are at the core of our national division. It's gonna be hard to talk about these without being a little bit political and without paying attention to how the politics created the situation that we're in right now. But those same forces also help us predict what's happening in the future. So if I offend someone, I apologize, but we're, um, we're gonna to have to break a few eggs to make a cake here. Also, when I um, set up the, the title for this, I said we're going to be at 30,000 feet. And what I meant by that is we're going to try and discuss uh, concepts that are straightforward enough that it's not going to require any particular special knowledge of the law in order to be able to follow what it is that we're talking about. I am not going to go down and parse all of the cases on substantive due process and procedural due process and get down in the fine print because a lot of that looks to the average observer like how many angels can dance on the head of a pen, and I don't think it's particularly productive. Second, the reason that I want to stay relatively general is I want us to be able to look at trends and maybe see big picture what's been happening, and that'll help us predict what is, what is happening going forward. So again, I recognize what kind of group I'm, I'm dealing with here. And for those of you who just are here for the answers, I'm gonna give you the answers and then I give you why. So um, maybe a Quentin Tarantino kind of movie here. Uh, first, I wanna say that the results that we're looking at in these cases are not a surprise. A lot of people have worked a long and hard, long and hard on these issues over the course of the past 40 years. Um, you might have heard of a group called the Federalist Society. They were started in, in 1982. Reagan was elected in 1980. And I think Grover Norquist headed down his um, no new taxes path in 1984. These trends have been there. They have been, these, there is a lot of money and there is a lot of effort behind these things. So what we are experiencing today is the fruit of their labors. So on the general topics, because we have four different topics, we have um, guns, personal liberty, elections, and campaign finance. So on guns, you know, we had the Bruin decision just came down, 
My, my prediction is, is that the court will continue to expand gun rights, even though a majority of Americans probably would like to see more reform. On personal uh, liberties, um, I can't tell you, it could go either way at this point, but I think you're gonna see challenges through state legislation or through court cases to same-sex marriage, uh, the right to be intimate with the person of your choosing, contraception, uh, the ability to cross state lines for an abortion, the status of frozen embryos, uh, which somebody did tell me this morning are actually zygotes and embryos have to be implanted before, but you're, you're gonna get the, the gist there. What happens when you have a um, fertilized egg that has not been implanted? What Does that become a human being? Is that protected? And then you're going to have, obviously, uh, some discussion and there are going to be cases about abortifacts. I think you may have already read articles on, on this, and I think that's uh, just the logical place for litigation to go. Meanwhile, and I don't mean to be, uh, I don't mean to overstate this, but poor individuals will go without health care that they need. Those that, that have means will be able to arrange their lives to uh, uh, get to where they need to be, either if, if that's for, for healthcare, if that's abortion or, or anything else. But the people who are gonna be most hurt by this are the people that are poor. And let's be clear, um, we in the United States have a really bad track record when it comes to um, the number of women who die in childbirth. We're at like 18 per 100,000. And that is a, that's a disgrace in the developed world. On elections, uh, the Supreme Court continues to be hands off on gerrymandering, which means that state legislatures can lock in their majorities forever. And congressional districts will go from not very competitive to not competitive at all. On campaign finance, we will continue to allow exorbitant sums of money poured into the PACs, which, we, which has a potential for skewing our laws in favor of those who make the biggest contributions. Um, you know, the old joke is you get the, we have the best Congress that money can buy. And I don't think that's changing anytime soon. On federal regulations, uh, I think with this court, you are seeing that um, agency regulations are going to be more scrutinized and a lot of them are going to be struck down. The goal of many people in the business community is to have a lot of those regulations removed uh, because obviously they add expense, they add time and delay and they frustrate what they're trying to do. There's an important uh, precedent called Chevron that helps courts decide when they can intervene on these rules I'm thinking that might get overturned and we'll probably hear about that later this week. In general, your rights will increasingly depend on where you live. So if you happen to be in Texas, you will not have access to an abortion. If you are in um, New York, you will absolutely have right to abortion. Uh, other rights will also be affected. So one of the things I do want to tell you before I get into these cases is that every one of these cases involve issues that Congress has the authority to decide and pass legislation. But if you look at the last 50 years, the big social year as big social issues have not been able to be addressed by Congress or in the legislature. They, they cannot do that. They are gridlocked. All of the major rights and advancements in rights have come from the courts. And that is in part why the Supreme Court confirmation hearings have become such a battleground because those in favor of expanding rights are up against the, those who seriously want to curtail some of those rights and maybe roll them back. Um, recently or this weekend, represent, Representative uh, Jamie Raskin, when he was asked comment on Dobbs said that the Supreme Court was able to decide these issues because Congress didn't and Congress is in, in partisan gridlock. Bottom line, 
Congress has ceded its authority to the Supreme Court. It's not doing its job. So let's go to our first case, uh, which came out last Thursday, and that's on gun regulation. That's uh, uh, called the Bruin case. It's against, it's against New York. Basically, New York required that you have proper cause before you could get a uh, license for concealed carry so that you could take your gun out in public. And the court found that you, uh, that this was unconstitutional because what the, uh, the standard was for deciding whether you could have proper cause was, quote, you had to demonstrate a special need for self-protection distinguishable from the general community. Where the Supreme Court thought that this went awry was the fact that it was placing a limit on a person's ability to carry a gun for self-defense out in public, which was a right that they said was being infringed upon. Now, one of the other things that they did address, however, is that does not mean that you can't require them to get a permit to carry the gun. It does not mean that you can't require them to go through training before they can have it. These, these concerns can still be addressed, but ultimately, you if you go through the steps, you should be able to get a gun. They did not call into question red flag laws, which uh, some states are, are passing, or any restriction on someone who might be deemed uh, mentally ill in a way that, that could cause physical harm to other people. I want to, um, for a minute here, basically what the, the Second Amendment says is the Second Amendment says that a well-regulated militia is the reason for the arms. And, and we have had a lot of litigation over the last um, 30 years about the scope of that and the, that certain groups, certain interest groups have, have pushed that significantly. And so gun rights have been expanded probably beyond what the original framers intended. I want to give you a um, sort of a frame of reference for the Second Amendment from which this comes from, because the Second Amendment is, is adopted with the Bill of Rights in 1791. And this is immediately post-revolutionary war. But there are some things that, that are relevant to when we look at the Second Amendment that people are not thinking about when they're looking at it right now. So one of them was that our founding fathers were inherently distrustful of standing armies because King George III was always running off and getting into wars and then taxing his people in order to pay for it. And they were, that was one of the reasons for the revolution. They were tired of paying his taxes. When the Bill of Rights was, was being enacted, however, the Southern states were extremely concerned about the ability to bear arms and the whole militia language that's in there because they had had, up until that time, slave rebellions. There was one of the most famous was the Stono Rebellion in 1739. They were also aware of what was happening in Haiti. And in 1791, and I'm not sure if it was right before or right after, but the, the Haitian Rebellion began and all of the enslavers were run off the island back to France and they became the slaves in Haiti um, began self-government. So I, if you look at this particular time, the Southern slaveholders or enslavers were very concerned about having guns so that they could protect themselves from their own slaves. And by the way, remember the Second Amendment only applied to white men. Slaves were not people, they did not have rights. So as we come back, the, the actual holding in this case is New York's proper cause requirement violates the 14th Amendment by preventing law-abiding citizens with ordinary self-defense needs from exercising their Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms in public for self-defense. Now, what's really interesting is Bruin was handed down on Thursday. The other thing that happened on Thursday was Congress actually stepped up to the plate and passed new gun regulations. Maybe not as strong as, as some people want, but it, it was progress. And I do predict that what they have passed will be upheld. Now, moving on to election law. And, and I'm gonna go back to 2010 
on election law because I think the trend is a long one and I think we need to be aware of it. Probably a, a case that most of you are familiar with is, is Citizens United via the Federal Election Commission. And in that case, the court equated the spending of money, campaign money, as speech, and then said, because corporations are composed of individuals who have free speech, corporations have free speech. And they then went on to strike down campaign finance restrictions that had been in place for more than 100 years. Uh, I think this, I don't have it in front of me, but I'm pretty sure that Justice Kennedy um, wrote this uh, decision. And in it, he dismissed the concerns that massive corporate contributions would somehow corrupt the political process. Um, I have a friend who actually says that, that, that people in Congress should be required like race cars to wear the, the sponsors on their, um, on their clothes. So the practical effect of that is since 2010, campaign finance has, has increased exponentially. You, you see the um, super PACs that have been created. And while you still can have limits on what you can donate to specific um, candidates, you can create a super PAC that is so highly aligned with what it is that the um, candidate's doing that it, it, it basically amounts to being coordinated with them and part of the campaign. That's 2010, 2013, you get Shelby County v. Holder. And in this one, the, you know, the 1965 Voting Rights Act was set up in order to monitor those states that had been suppressing uh, honestly, uh, black turnout at the at at the polls. They were doing all sorts of things like creating, um, you know, reading tests or literacy tests, and uh, making it very difficult for people to to vote. So when Congress adopted the Voting Rights Act, they they included sections uh, four and five, which created this preclearance process that required a state to come back and and get approval through the Justice Department before changing a particular voting practice or voting law. In, uh, in 2013, the, the Supreme Court held that the um, Tenth Amendment reserves to all states, all powers not specifically granted to the federal government, including the power to regulate elections. So again, this is one place where if Congress had stepped in, there would be no issue. But I, in what I think was an incredibly um, either naive or cynical, uh, and, and you know we can debate what it is, but they found that, that these uh, protections for minority voters were no longer needed. I wonder if they still feel the same way. So the impact of that is, is that we no longer have uh, these states subject to review. Although I will say that under section three, if a state is deemed to be uh, uh, now discriminating against certain voters, Section 3 allows them to be put back in if discrimination is found. Coming forward to 2019, and I'm going to probably mispronounce this, but it's Rucco v. Common Cause. I put this in here because this is, this is a trend. There's several cases. You saw this in, in, in 2020. I think both Wisconsin and um, uh, Pennsylvania had issues that they were trying to run up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, no, we're not interested in this. But in this 2019 ruling, both North Carolina and Maryland residents challenged partisan redistricting uh, as unconstitutional gerrymandering. And I want to distinguish between two types of gerrymandering. There is racial gerrymandering and there is partisan gerrymandering. And racial gerrymandering, I can't tell you how it works. It, it, I have read case after case after case, and each time I, I walk away confused, but apparently somebody knows how that works. Partisan gerrymandering, the court had tried to come up with rules that, 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 that worked, but ultimately they couldn't find a rule that, that would work. So they threw up their hands. And this is, falls under the category of what they call a political question. And they left it to Congress and state legislatures to resolve. 
I think the bottom line out of this particular case is that states that are currently dominated by one party can lock, some, lock themselves into power for the foreseeable future. Third case I want to talk to you about is the Federal Election Commission, or fourth, the Federal Election Commission beats Ted Cruz, just came down. And um, this was, I think, a setup for a Supreme Court challenge. There was a campaign finance restriction on the repayment of loans from candidates uh, above $250,000. And of course, Senator Cruz, whose campaign actually had $2.2 million on hand, loaned his campaign $260,000 prior to the end of the campaign, and then sought repayment of that from donations that came in after the election. The, <laughs> the, the court, had no concern that these post-election contributions would somehow be equated to bribes or otherwise give the appearance of corruption. I do not know what world they're living in. Anyway, again, the same holding here is, as in the earlier cases, money equals speech. So the trend I see is no limits on spending, uh, which means whoever has the most money wins or can buy the, their Congress or state legislature, whatever they would like. The third line of cases I kind of want to talk about is the federal regulatory powers. And these are all related, by the way. I didn't choose them randomly, but the currently pending West Virginia v. EPA. And the way that our law works is that Congress writes the laws, but there's not, it's not possible for them to write every single detail. And then we rely on the agencies to, through their rulemaking authority and through the process, which is, is also subject to court review, that we let them fill in the blanks in, in, in between. And uh, basically Congress says, here's what I want you to do. And then the how-to ends up often being written by the experts off in the agencies. Well, there is a, a long precedent called the Chevron case where the court says, look, we first look to see if, it, if Congress has specific direction on this. If they do, that, that's the end of the inquiry. But if they don't, then we look to whether this, could, this rulemaking could in fact be covered under a particular statute that they might be pointing to. There is one statute in particular uh, that, that they are pointing to in West Virginia v. EPA, and there are four different suits that have been consolidated, all against the same section. And the, over, the, the, the overarching goal of this is to severely roll back regulation. So um, they're looking for agencies to have less discretion. I'll make an analogy. Virginia has what's called a, a Dillon's Rule. And the Dillon's rule says, you have the powers that the legislature specifically gave you and those that are necessarily implied therefrom. Uh, anybody who has any connection with local land use authority has, in, in Virginia is, is very familiar with this particular um, provision. Uh, the Dillon rule has been much hated by uh, local governments for years and years and years. Uh, and it was, it's a line of attack that frequently gets um, any kind of regulation narrowed down. Um, bottom line, I expect Chevron to either be severely limited, reinterpreted. I would be surprised if it is outright overruled um, because we could not, if, if you can envision a world where Congress had to write not only the law, but all the regulations that implement it, I think you can understand that, that these people who can't even agree that the sky is blue are not going to be able to do that and nothing will get done. Now, for some people, I think that might be the goal. Uh, but if you're interested in good government and having you know, regulations that, that can be applied, you, these agencies have to have some latitude in writing what they're doing. So it'd be interesting to see where the court comes down on that, but I expect them to overrule Chevron. By the way, that that case uh, that case comes out of the CPP, which was an Obama era attempt to 
write regulations regarding uh, emissions from uh, coal-fired and other fossil fuel-fired power stations across the country. Um, if that was in 2014. In 2017, uh, the Trump administration decided that they didn't want to do that and they came up with uh, ACE, and I can't remember what that is, but I think it's affordable cost is, is, are the first two words. And that was designed to supplant that, but it didn't do anything in terms of uh, limiting emissions. It will be interesting again to see where the, where the court comes down on this, because if the EPA cannot regulate these things, then we have no opportunity to address the issues of climate change through the EPA. Congress will need to, to do some kind of separate authorization or some uh, additional legislation, which I think most people looking at Congress in its current state would say, gee, not likely. So finally, and I suspect that every one of you has, has at least heard something about this case, this is under the personal liberty, and this is this is the Dobbs decision, which came down on Friday, and um, it it is a case based on a Mississippi law, which was uh, designed specifically to challenge Roe. It limits abortion after 15 weeks, and at the time that it was handed down, it was very clear it did not meet the the requirements of uh, Roe. The court overruled Roe v. Wade. I think most people have heard that by now. Uh, it was an extremely important precedent for 49 years, uh, which had been reaffirmed in 1992 in the Casey case. And the interesting part about 1992 Casey decision is the court in that case worried about some of the, the uh, lack of reasoning and some of the, the uh, conclusions that had been reached in the Roe decision, but three of the justices said, we are going to affirm Roe because it is such an important precedent and we are not going to um, create chaos by overruling Roe. Those people lived in a different time. So in this ruling, uh, the Dobbs ruling, Alito is the one who, who wrote it, um, I, I, and I first want to say that six of the sitting Supreme Court justices are very devout Catholics. They, um, their religion is an important part of who they are. And I think it's hard to see how they might um, separate their beliefs from their rulings. I think they would like us to feel that they have, but I, I, maybe not. Anyway, Alito goes through the, the um, analysis. And the first analysis is your constitutional right is protected if you can find it in express words, okay? So if the, if, uh, the 14th Amendment or some other part of the Constitution had said, you know, the right to abortion shall not be abridged, then they would say, they go great. The second place he goes after that is, if it is not clearly written there, then we go back and we look at the original understanding of the Constitution as it was adopted in 1788-89. And that's a, little, that's a little problem. Because, you know, where Alito says it's not specifically mentioned. Um, and he goes through this analysis of then was it, was it available? And was it a right at the time of the Constitution? And, you know, he goes back through history, long time, back to the 14th century, and even looks at stuff predating the Salem witch trials and concludes no abortion wasn't a right. Now, Roe had been decided on what is called the substantive due process clause of the, um, of the 14th Amendment. And, that is a, for lack of a better word, judicially created concept because the 14th Amendment talks about due process and due process gets divided into two categories, procedural due process, which would be like, did I get my day in court? Did I get my notice? Did I have, you know, did I have my trial by jury? Substantive due process seems to be a uh, category that was created that has uh, people would probably describe as privacy rights, 
in it. And, and, and so Roe was decided under that. So was, um, so were many of the other cases that came afterwards involving significant personal rights. Anyway, uh, Thomas says, look, substantive due process uh, is not really a thing. And he says, we should reconsider all the, the cases that are based on substantive due process, including Griswold, which was about contraception, Lawrence, which was about um, the, the sodomy laws, and Obergefell. He says, because any, any substantive due process decision is demonstrably erroneous. This is a big leap. Um, this is years and years and years of decisions that are basically being thrown to the wind. Now, Thomas is only one person, and this is not binding. If you look in the Alito decision, as well as the um, concurrence with Kavanaugh, they're saying, no, these cases are not back on the table. What differentiates uh, Dobbs in, in the uh, case is about abortion, and that includes another life not just the, the individual involved. Now, Chief Justice Roberts is what's known as an institutionalist. His name is on that court, and he is very concerned about how the court is perceived and the legitimacy of the court. You probably have read several articles over the course of the last year where different, um, different justices have gone out and they have talked about the legitimacy of the court. And unfortunately, <laughs> they've done it in unfortunate ways. Um, Amy Cohen Barrett uh, went and, and made a speech at the McConnell Center in front of Mitch McConnell uh, about the legitimacy of the court, and she was the last one who was sort of um, hurriedly put on the court before um, Biden took office. So um, anyway, coming back to this decision, Roberts would have been more incremental. And courts have a rule of construction that basically says, we only decide the case that is in front of us. And the case that was in front of them was the 15 week ban from Mississippi. The, the, the five member majority just blew past that and said, no, we're going back and we're just gonna completely overrule Roe, which we think was wrongly decided and um, had very poor reasoning and has been hard to implement. And that's, I, I, it's hard for me to describe how radical that, that decision is because there's this concept called stare decisis. And there's a lot of discussion in the Dobbs opinion about stare decisis, what it means, what it doesn't mean. And the, in, in, in the case, both Alito and Kavanaugh say, look, we, we have overruled other cases in the past. That is true. They have overruled other cases in the past, but always with the uh, intent to expand rights, not to take them away. And what uh, is very one-off, very unique about this particular case is that the court has gone back overruled an earlier precedent, and it's for the purpose of taking away a right that has been established for 50 years. Now, the whole concept of stare decisis is the law should be stable, because when the law is stable, then people can make decisions as to how they, they work. Uh, you often hear this around tax regulations. We shouldn't change tax regulations because people have made investment decisions on those. Okay, fine. Um, but with notice and over time, we do make those changes. This particular case, while people anticipated this case, I don't think that they fully understood uh, how far reaching it was. And let me um, see if I do have this list of things that are affected by this. No, I do not. But, you know, the other issues that are going to be raised, aside from what your state does, are people going to find themselves uh, prosecuted for going across state lines to get an abortion? Kavanaugh and his, his um, concurrence says, no, that's, that, that's not happening. Will people who send abortifacts uh, the, the medications that, that cause abortion to people asking for them in states that have banned abortion, 
um, will, will they somehow be prosecuted? If I assist somebody in going across state lines or I otherwise pay for them to go to another state in order to get an abortion, will I be subject to criminal penalties? Um, the, there are a whole host of things that, that are going to be litigated over the course of the next four or five years, maybe longer, uh, including, for instance, if somebody uses an abortive act at home and the miscarriage is not complete and they go to the hospital, is the hospital complicit in this? Do they have liability? And I think you can see that healthcare providers who might be involved in um, these kind of issues might be at, at risk. And then of course, and I think I mentioned this earlier, there is the issue of what happens with um, fertilized eggs that have not been implanted. Now, most IVF centers have a contract. The contract says, if you get divorced, right, we destroy, we destroy these. Or we, if, if you can come up with an agreement as to who can own them, then that's fine, we will, we will give them. But we're not releasing these without agreement of both parties. And I think that that's because all of us have an interest in not being a parent if we didn't intend to be a parent. So yes, they, provided the genetic material that created those, um, those fertilized eggs. But each considered that they had the control as to whether they would be implanted, the timing and if they would be implanted. The whole concept that a, maybe a couple that has gone separate ways and has formed new relationships that, that one of the parties would be able to use those eggs in order to create a new family is, is I think very distressing for a lot of people. So I do want to come back to what Alito is saying. Alito is, is saying, if you, if, you, if you are not expressly out there, we got to go look back at what was the situation at the time the constitution was amended and what were those rights. And I just want to run through for you what the world looked like in 1791. 70, well, the Bill of Rights is, is from 1791. Others are, are written in 1788, finally signed 1789. So at that time, only men could vote. Women could not own property in their own names. People of color were property, more akin to livestock than human. And including their reproduction was regulated by their masters. Slavery was a prevalent um, uh, condition in, in the nation. There were no trains, planes, automobiles, no electricity, no indoor plumbing, and clearly no internet. And if you really want to understand how undemocratic all of this was at the time, and how unrepresented so many people were, 55 relatively well-off white men met at the Constitutional Convention and 39 of them signed the document that then formed the basis of our government. That might not be the place where you want to hang your hat. So one of the things that, that, that's at play here, and this, is, this applies to all of these cases, is that the people that have come on the court, the last three people coming on the court, um, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and um, Amy Barrett, Cohen, Amy Barrett um, all build themselves as what are called textualists or originalists. If you can't find it in the document, then it, it, you know, it's, not, it's gonna get an extra level of scrutiny. And there is this tension between is the constitutional, is the constitution what was written or is it as it has been adopted? Is it a living constitution? And I will say in some religions, um, I know in Judaism, there are some people that, that think that uh, Torah is, is the word of God. Um, and if I've gotten that wrong, I apologize. And, and there are others who think that it's a living document to be interpreted through the time when people are living. I frankly, in 2022, don't want to be governed by 1791 
thinking because I think we've evolved a lot since then. The other part is if we are going to look at only what's in the original document or what's in the Bill of Rights or, or the other amended, uh, other amendments, then I think we throw out all of the case law that has existed up until this point. And that's problematic. Um, I, I, I don't think we can really go there and have an effective society. So at this point, I, I would like to move to the questions if there are, um, I do think we got some questions in here before. Louise, do you have some for me? Um, I do. Go ahead. Are we going to do the Eric, upcoming events or? Yeah, um, just, uh, Michael, let's just take a minute. Terry's going to tell us what's coming up because we find that the minute we get into questions and answers, not everybody um, stays till the very end. So we want to make sure we know. <laughs> okay. okay. Coming up uh, for the uh, events are, we have uh, on July 11th, we, at the three o'clock, we have Looking In and Looking Out the Arts of China and Japan, uh, presented by Ruth uh, Kurzbauer and Carol Morlin. And on Monday, July 25th, uh, three o'clock, we have Spycraft, a conversation with author uh, Robert Wallace. And as a reminder that uh, after you log on, there is a survey uh, that we'd like you to fill out. And, uh, um, and that, you know, really appreciate that if you could do that. And uh, that's about it for the, uh, the upcoming events. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Louise for questions. Okay, Terry, thank you. Well, Michael, you st stimulated a lot of conversation here. Lots of questions coming in, and we had some to start out with, right? So, so uh, we might be here till midnight. You know, I don't want to scare anybody. But, yeah. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very compelling conversation. Thank you. You got us. Uh, I, I particularly appreciate that you spoke in English and not uh, legalese. So those of us that are not lawyers, we appreciate that, okay? Because we're, we're, we're hungry to understand what's going on. So. so the first question that came in actually even before your presentation was, are there any controversies or disagreements on the original interpretation of the Constitution? Actually, I guess you, you mentioned many of them. Yeah, this, uh, is, this, this actually is, is the last bit that I was talking about, which is that um, this uh, tension between is the Constitution a living document or is the Constitution a, um, you know, fixed in time and that's the only interpretation that you can, you can have. I'm going to suggest that people who are looking for, you know, originalism or textualist actually are looking for a result. And you have to look and see what the result is that they are interested in to understand why it is they want it to be that way. Um, you know, I think my my bias is pretty clear. I think the document is a living um, document and that it grows with our society. And otherwise, I wouldn't be married and have any of the rights that I have today. I'd be a criminal. Well, that didn't happen. Um, a question here uh, actually relates to that. My question is regarding gay, gay marriage rights. If they take them away, how do people who have a pension uh, by being a spouse Fair, fair with this. Can the federal government take away pensions that have been granted to a spouse based on gay marriage? Right. So pulling out my crystal ball and you can, um, you know, this is worth everything you're paying for it. The, uh, the, um, I think that existing marriages will be protected. I think, and there's going to be lots of chaos falling out of the Dobbs decision, but I think if you overrule marriage, you, um, you create, uh, a real mess, even at the state level. I don't care what the state's particular opinion is. It, it will, in fact, um, create a mess because I, I do a lot of family law. And, and to unwind all of those rights that, and, and assets and everything else that have been acquired throughout the entire marriage takes a lot of work. Uh, and let me make a decision. Let me make a, an analogy. Is the Proposition 8 cases that passed in California. I happened to get married in 2008. And that little window of opportunity between, between June and November that I was talking about when the Proposition 8 passed, uh, um, all of the people who were married during that window were deemed to be married and treated as married for, for those purposes. 
uh, relative to um, you know, Obergefell, if the constitutional right to same-sex marriage is somehow overruled, and I, I don't know it's a foredrawn conclusion, the Windsor decision is still there. Windsor says, hey, if the federal, if, if somebody is married in their state, they're married for federal purposes because marriage is defined by state law, not by federal law. I will point out, by the way, in, in all of that discussion about what's in the Constitution and what's not in the Constitution, I, I, you know, you could go into the Constitution, but you will never find the word marriage. So marriage is obviously not a constitutional right, at least, you know, if you're going to be very literal about this. Bottom line is, I think if you are in a state that recognizes your marriage, you're going to be fine. And that's the general rule that, that I'm laying out here, which is your rights as an individual are going to be covered mostly by state law uh, at, at this point. But if you are married under your state law, then you are going to be recognized as being married under federal law. I think it's going to be very hard for them not to do that. Here's a different take on things. As a, as a Jew, my religion does not prohibit, prohibit abortion unless the practitioner is ultra-Orthodox, which is hardly a surprise. Given that the Supreme Court has now imposed on me, the writer, the tenets and beliefs of a religion to which I do not belong, can it legally be said that the court now, ha now um, can, has, has now illegally stopped me from practicing the tenets of my belief system? So uh, a couple of things. First of all, the Supreme Court just said there is no right to abortion under the law. Therefore, whatever the state is going to define whether you have a right to abortion or not, not the Supreme Court. The other part is, is that even if divorce is permissible under your religion, right, you're, you're still subject to it. It isn't telling you that you have to get a divorce. In other words, um, there were some cases, and I don't remember the names, but uh, I think they were the, the peyote cases where the Indians said, look, using peyote is an important part of our religious practice. We all get not, and we, you know, and we are connected with uh, the spirits. And that was deemed to be part of their religion. So I I hear what you're saying, and it's, it's good that it, that. The, um, the Judaism recognizes this right, but it's not being, your religious rights are not being affected by this. But, and I don't, I can't really think right off the bat what the other things might be, but you're gonna see religion come up against some of these laws and some of these restrictions, I, but I don't know what those will look like. So, so the way it stands right now, since this decision just came down, the legal precedent, take the legality of this, or the illegality of abortion, would seem to take precedence over a religious belief. Is that, is that, am I correct in saying that? The legality versus a religious belief. I'm having a hard time um, because they, they feel a little bit like apples and oranges to me. And let's, let's go back the other way. Okay. Um, the Supreme Court said everybody has a right to an abortion it, previously. If I was following Catholic doctrine, then I would not, my religion says I don't believe in, in abortion. So I would not have an abortion. But the fact that I could have an abortion doesn't keep me from practicing my faith. Mm -hmm. That's the best answer I can give on that. Okay. okay. And the next question is from Mona. She says, as the Supreme Court becomes more conservative and is, uh, and is not consistent with the views of the majority of Americans, what can be done? Vote. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting. Um, Alito, in his opinion, says, look, we recognize that what we're ruling today may not be what the majority of Americans believe. And then, and, and, and then he goes on to say, not our problem. We just read the Constitution. And I'm going to say that is a change because I'm going to say the court typically has had some level of connection to what was happening in society in general. Even though they might not uh, expressly say so, 
they didn't live in an ivory tower. They, 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 they didn't go off and promulgate laws without looking at people and looking at society. Um, Betty Edelman asks, where in the Constitution is there a right to privacy? Specifically where? So I, again, remind you of my disclaimer that I'm not a constitutional lawyer to privacy. It's, a, it's, only, it's only something that's appeared in decisions. And if we go back to, uh, you know, the time when the Constitution was adopted, was there a right to privacy, a recognized right to privacy? I'd be surprised if they find that there was. So that's an implied right then? It's a judicially created concept. Okay, okay. That's what I meant by implied right, but yes. Okay, I got you. I'm not a lawyer either, so I know everybody dances on the head of a pin about the language, so I will not <laughs> put forth any more language here. Yeah, if there are any lawyers who got a better on, on here who've got a better idea, please chime in. Okay. Um, Judge Alito's, um, Laura, uh, Lorna asked a question. Judge uh, Alito starts the Dobbs decision with, um, with stating that this was a moral issue. Could you please describe how morality is incorporated into the legal canon? Slavery at one point was not deemed immoral, and so I find the courts looking to the past to be questionable. Also, how does the court evaluate issues involving changing technology? Maybe you need it in two pieces, huh? Yeah, I was um, going to say, you know, compound question. I object. Yeah, the last one, the last <laughs> one, uh, kind, of, kind of came out of nowhere. Okay, so the issue about morality: uh, how is it defined? How does it? How does it relate? So, you know, morality like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And I do think that we have some generally agreed upon um, principles as society, um, but, but different people have different. Now, I have no doubt that Justice um, Alito and Justice Thomas think it's a moral issue. Um, I think that that is a very consistent with their faith, right? But I don't know that everybody considers that to be a moral issue. Is it, um, is it something people want to think about long and hard? Yes, I, I, I think that's true. But my morality may not be your morality. In fact, I'm pretty darn sure that my morality doesn't, doesn't align completely with Alito's and, and uh, Kavanaugh's and, and the other conservatives on the court. By the way, they are not conservatives in, in the following sense. If a conservative means to maintain the status quo, that's not what these people are doing. These people are changing the status quo significantly. And so uh, we might want to revisit our language around them. Um, uh, do you want to comment also on her question about uh, changing technology and how does that relate to issues being in front of the court? Um, well, you know, look, the place we're changing, it, on the abortion issue, changing technology, I mean, there was a lot of discussion in uh, Roe regarding the viability standard. And there was the notion that maybe viability would be the way that we would decide when an abortion was, accept was possible and was not. When could, when could the fetus exist outside the womb? I think that Roe balances or tries to balance the interest of the woman in controlling, having control over her life and, and her future against the, the uh, societal interest in, in protecting the unborn. And it's, so it's, it's an arbitrary line, which I think, you know, even every commentator would look at it and say, look, the, <laughs> it's a line, it got drawn by the court. Generally speaking, in our, in our constitutional system, we expect legislatures to draw lines, not courts. And so in that respect, Roe was outside the norm and it was pretty much a one-off, but it was such a big decision. Um, you know, there is discussion in Alito's uh, opinion where he says, this 
should have been able to be worked out through the state legislatures, but instead the court jumped in and just cut it off. That's what uh, that's what Roberts wanted, right? Right. No, no. Roberts Roberts is not in favor of abortion at all, but he did want an incremental approach. Right. On the other, right. you know, the, the main point was there is is that fetal viability is earlier in the pregnancy now than it was at the time of Roe. And it's, and it's conceivable that viability could be, that I could take a, uh, that I could take a zygote, a fertilized egg, at some point in the future through technology and, and turn it into a human being. So does that zygote now become a, become a protected entity? The other thing is, you know, frankly, I could take a fertilized egg and I could implant it in the surrogate and there would be a real person. So does that mean that the zygote is otherwise, uh, you know, protected at this point? Those are inherently line drawing issues and they're, 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 they're very difficult and Congress doesn't want to get in them because there's no winning on that one. Yeah. Yeah. The other place technology is killing us is in, um, in, in our social media. And I, you know, that's beyond where we can go today, but the whole business of what constitutes free speech and how it gets disseminated, who it gets disseminated and how much truth is in it is, is at the core of our democracy right now and is burning us down. And, and while that the internet's great, cause you know, I was able to do a lot of research there today that would have required time in libraries, you know, previously, that was wonderful, but with that, we're paying a price. Uh, next question is actually, it's a, a, a statement that he would, uh, that George Hober would ask you to comment on. Why well, have the forces who insist women carry pregnancies to term refuse to insist that the male who, in, wait a minute. Oh, I just lost. Um, uh, uh, the male who, uh, why has the, even though women are asked to take the, the pregnancy to term, has there not been energy about insisting that the male who impregnated the woman take responsibility to support the child with the same energy and thoroughness? They insist the children must be born, but take little concern about how they will be cared for. You know, I've, I've, I've read that meme around, and it, it, it is interesting because, you know, most of our focus is after the child is born. And we have child support laws. It does not mean that the, that the child support that, that the mother is going to receive is going to be sufficient to provide for the child or to raise the child. And in fact, as a society, we've done a really poor job making sure that moms had enough in, in the way of food and, and housing and whatever else to, and, and to raise their children. Um, but the answer is, I'm not sure we have a lot of support pre birth. And after birth, the, the societal, what we have is, is child support. And child support can include health insurance. But if you want to talk about society at large, we're not doing much. And, and I, you know, that, that inherently, again, is a political issue. And I think the reason that we don't have more support for them is because no one has pushed the politicians to provide it. I, 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 let me add, I think the issue is um, a big enough dollar number that nobody wants to touch it. Uh, the next two questions have to do with what, what can we do? The first question is, given that the current court seems to be, uh, seems to be strict uh, constitutionalists, and two, the current Congress seems incapable of passing any major, major legis legislation about the topics you, you covered in your talk, and three, voting laws are being changed so that it's more difficult uh, for people of lesser means to vote. How can we change laws to accommodate the will of the majority of people rather than the minority? Yeah, that's a $64,000 question. I don't know if you had a chance to read um, how civil wars start and how to stop them. But, you know, 
What the Supreme Court did in this particular instance is take the culture wars and pour gasoline on them. So, um, you know, now we've, we've always had a revved up right, now we got a revved up left, and each considers that they are, are acting on principle. And I don't see this getting better. I would say that from a dollar perspective, you know, every congressman spends at least four hours a day raising money from donors and not legislating. Because the first priority of any politician is to get reelected. And the money even in the local races is stupid money. I mean, a million dollars on a, on a, you know, a state representative campaign. And then you've got the, you've got the national groups, you know, weighing in. I have a theory, and I don't think this is going to be a very popular theory, but if you, but if you look at the cases that we, that have been decided, right, the Federalist Society put three of those judges on the court and six of them have been, pre, have either been previous members or are current members. And their goals are lower taxes and they are business friendly regulations, meaning rolled back regulations. And they are looking for more strict, uh, more textualism, contextualism, and they were opposed to abortion. And they, they arose, when I said that, you know, this process has been going on for 40 years, that's when Federalist Society was, was established. And there has been a huge amount of money spent on getting the composition of Congress and the state legislatures to where it is. And it's been a long-term plan to, to do it and a big investment. And I will tell you that there was the alliance that was created um, by Reagan, where he put together um, what I'll call the business conservatives and the social conservatives and created a large pot of money uh, through which he could then fund uh, all of these social issues, the wedge issues, in order to get voters to the polls so that then the Republicans could get in and that, that they supported and give them the tax cuts that they sought. I think if you want, if you, you know, Louise and I were talking about this earlier. Now, lawyers kind of have a um, test, a question we ask ourselves. If I'm looking at a situation, I don't understand it, and I can't quite make clear why it's happening. We ask, who's benefiting from this problem? Who, and, and by the way, benefit means dollars in the pockets. And, you know, if we look at the string of decisions, well, legislative acts, going back to 1980, so... Um, all of them have been in favor of the more wealthy. And, and by the way, in this country, people hold wealth in ownership of corporations. Um, if you go back to um, pre-Civil War, pre-industrial, wealth was in, in land and in slaves. Uh, but at this point, most people hold their wealth in corporations. So if you look at Elon Musk, if you look at um, Jeff Bezos, they own corporations that, that have huge value. And they can use those corporations in order to increase their value through uh, making donations and getting tax cuts. So it's, it's probably not a mistake. If you go back and you look at from 1920 to, to I mean, from a 20, 20, 20, 2000 to 2022, that the top 1% have increased their net worth exponentially. So my theory is that the social conservatives provide the wedge issues that are creating the division and the distraction, right? If I'm fighting with you about abortion, if I'm fighting with you about the rights of, of same-sex couples to marry, you're not going to particularly notice my 2017 tax act where I gave $2.7 billion, 83% of which went to the very, very wealthy top 1%. Um, is there a vast conspiracy? No, there's not a vast conspiracy, but there's a whole lot of people pleading in the same direction. And I think in part, I, I don't have the answer because I don't think that Congress has the will. And I think we've actually gone beyond the tipping point. I don't think we come back without some kind of radical realignment 
And in 1861, we thought that was civil war. Are we going to go to civil war? No. But there are a lot of political uh, commentators out there who think we're going to go into what they're going to call the great unrest. And um, so there'd be a lot of jockeying going forward. I wish I had better news on that, but I don't. Louise, what else uh, you uh, Okay, so uh, pivoting over to guns. Um, and there are two questions that are uh, questions about guns here. How has the concept of an armed militia been expanded so that almost any individual without having their background checked be able to purchase weapons of mass destruction? That's one no. part, part of it. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. First, I would say yes. <laughs> I agree entirely. It has been. Um, you, you know, if you go back to 1994, we adopted... Um, regulations on those high capacity magazines and, and the, basically the weapons of war. And then at, at the end of 10 years that, that expired and it did not get reenacted, we were under the um, Greater Republican Administration and Republican Congress at, at, at that point. There was no stomach for renewing those limitations. You, I, I, I will clarify, I don't think you can get a bazooka. I don't think you can get a rocket launcher. I, you know, the, the weapons of war for the larger stuff, you can't get a hold of. And if you try to get a hold of it, you will show up on some federal authorities watch list. I have no explanation as to why anybody needs an AR-50 or an AK-47. AK uh, AK it's just beyond my understanding. You know, frankly, if the issue is sort of self-defense in your house, as a, as a friend of mine says, uh, as his father says, he's rather old school, he says, get a shotgun because you don't have to be a very good shot with a, with a shotgun for self-defense and it doesn't go through the drywall. So all, <laughs> all these other weapons of war, I have no idea why they are available to everybody except that the gun manufacturers wanted to push that. And, and, and I will say... If you look at the 2016 election, there was $30 million given to the NRA to push their issues to create further division. Uh, and I assume that it is because guns are a useful wedge issue, again, to create the division that distracts us from, from the bigger issues. Uh, relative to your, uh, your comment about which guns, uh, Jack Royer makes a comment, if we need to look at the history and original intent, shouldn't the Second Amendment provide a right to a muzzle-loading musket? Because that's what they were using back then. So, <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm with him. <laughs> uh, comment here about the uh, the New York gun case that was just uh, brought forward. And uh, the, uh, the, um, Jill Z Ziegler says um, that it was not necessarily brought forth by individuals. Uh, that, the, that the Supreme Court identified this as a case that they wanted to rule on. Is that correct? I'm sorry, can you restate that? Uh, well, I'll read it exactly as she put it. I was interpreting a little bit. I understand that the New York gun case was picked by the Supreme Court and not necessarily brought forth by individuals. Is, is that the case or is it, who chooses what, what will come in front of the court is really the question. Okay, all right. So the way the cases go up to the Supreme Court um, is that, that people apply, they have a case, it's at a lower court level, um, you know, it's, it's, and it has to generally involve a, a, a federal issue. So let's assume that it's at a court of appeals, it's been to the district court, then it's gone to the court of appeals. The um, Supreme Court has the ability to look at those cases and say, yeah, we're not taking that right now. So they get that. I have no idea how many cases are applied for in the Supreme Court review, and it's called certiorari is, is, is the process. Um, I can't tell you how many uh, are applied for cert, but they look at all of those and they say, this is an issue I want to deal with, and they bring it up, okay? So towards that end, yes, the gun case was something they were interested in commenting on, um, and it takes, I think it takes four justices to decide that they want to hear the case in order for it to be uh, get granted cert. Okay. Um, could the Supreme Court roll back our rights, including um, revisiting Loving versus Virginia? Um, you know, that's a very interesting question because, um, I, and I did not go back and read Loving v. Virginia uh, for today. 
there is pr there are probably strong equal rights uh, uh, basis for loving the Virginia that might not apply to um, the, the string of cases I was talking about, which is Lawrence and, and Windsor and Obergefell. Um, so could they? Sure. Any, you know, what this decision means is any decision that this court thinks is not based in the textual basis of, of, of the Constitution is ripe for revisiting. And I want, <laughs> I don't have any good news today, <laughs> but I do want to plant a seed. And it's this. Live by the sword, die by the sword. If you are going to say that the, that we're going to look at the plain meaning of what's in front of us. And we're going to ignore previous precedents that we don't like. We don't think it matches up with the plain meaning that we've got in front of us. That's an opportunity as well as a, as a problem to be dealt with. So let's, let's take the equal protection cases. The equal protection clause um, it, it was you know, really post civil war and it was designed to really be very all encompassing although it was primarily thought of as dealing in race relations um, uh, and protecting African-Americans and, and the newly freed men. But equal protection is equal protection is equal protection. As far as I'm concerned, there's, there's a lot of cases that you can go back and say, this is an equal protection case for this class of people or that class of people. The reason I think that substantive due process, and again, I'm not a constitutional scholar, and if my, um, if my constitutional law teacher is still, professor is still alive, I'm gonna probably put him in his grave, and if he's in his grave, he's gonna roll with everything I'm saying. But I think that sub substantive due process um, became a doctrine to compensate for the fact that equal protection got eviscerated in the slaughterhouse cases in the 1870s. So you could resurrect the meaning of equal protection by taking the plain words and going back and throwing them against some precedents you don't like. Please? That's scary. Uh, a comment um, from Carol Cochran here that uh, our preamble sets four or five objectives. Do any of these carry any weight in interpreting the constitution? For example, the first objective is to establish justice. Therefore, is injustice constitutional? We have exceeded my pay grade. <laughs> okay. It's, that's a complicated I, you know, question. Uh, it, 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 it is interesting, but, but uh, generally speaking, uh, preambles, uh, and, and so I'll make an analogy to a contract. In a contract, you know, often it says, whereas, 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 whereas. Uh, it, that's what we call sort of precatory. It's just nice and it's informative, but it's not binding. Okay. Okay. That, that answers, that addresses it. Um, this harkens back to something I think you alluded to earlier. What is the best way for ordinary citizens to fight the decisions that you have dis discussed today? What's, what, what can we do as ordinary people? So when I think about the the amount of money that is available to the people who are, are pushing these causes, right? Because it's useful. And let me explain. If I have a, 130 billion, or if I have 300 billion, throwing a couple hundred million at a few elections in order to get $5.7 billion worth of tax breaks is, is I mean, that's chump change. That's a great investment. That's a huge return on their investment. You know, in, in this country, you know, the people who I think have, are most identified with pushing these conservative causes are the Koch brothers, Koch Industries, and I think the Mercers are, are, are often mentioned as, as people who donate heavily. Sheldon Addison um, also did this. And I think it's really hard to muster enough dollars to make a difference there. Do I, in my more angry moments, think that if people started taking self-help into their hands that you might get some um, changes on the other side? I don't think so, and here's why. If you remember, there was that baseball game 
um, where the guy drove down from Ohio and he had a high capacity uh, uh, rifle. And he said, who are the Republicans out there as you're sitting up there? And they're like, oh, well, there's Steve Scalise and whatever. And so he starts shooting. Right? And you would think that that would be sort of a wake up call for um, members of Congress of both parties to say, wow, you know, maybe it's really time to start doing something about this. Nope, crickets. So I don't have an answer. If I did have an answer, boy, I'd be parading it, you know, across social media uh, and, and, and on TV uh, because, I, but again, voting is the best thing we can do. The other thing is to the extent that your rights are gonna be determined by state law, become very involved in your, your, your state campaigns and, and, and efforts. You know, as a gay man, I have had all of my adult life, I have had to contribute money to campaigns in order to have my relationship recognized, okay? And to, and to support people who would at least fight for it. I think there's a lot of people who think that the political process exists sort of separate from them. I, I'm hoping that we're getting to the point where we realize, no, that process down in Richmond matters if you're, you know, if you're a Virginia resident. I think the other thing I think you're gonna see is I think you're gonna say people are going, I'm done. I'm moving someplace that's more consistent with my values. And in fact, that is actually happening. So Northern California is very conservative. And my, my brother, who, who is on the opposite side of the field for me, my brother calls me up and says, guess where people from California are moving? And I said, well, my best guess would be Texas because it's got lower taxes and it's more in accord with, with their political beliefs. Is that is true for the conservatives. Where do you think the blue, blue state guys are going? I'm like, I don't know. And he says, Portugal. And, you know, look, I, and I don't want to be alarmist here because, you know, it, and I keep trying to keep perspective because during my lifetime, I have lived under a legal system that called me a criminal and I still had a perfect, nice life. OK, there were things I could not do. 1992, I couldn't uh, until 1992, I couldn't get a security clearance. Right. So I couldn't go work for the federal government uh, until I don't know, what, what, 2010, 2012. I couldn't be in the US military, right? So I'm used to these obstacles, but I'm unique in that sense. If you've had all these privileges and you've enjoyed all these things, people start taking them away. It feels, um, it, 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 it not only does not feel very good, it, it feels like a lesser life and I want those things back. So, you know, I, I, I don't know what to tell you because I, I don't see that the political process is rigged in most states. In Virginia, we're still purple. I will note that, that Governor Youngkin said, oh, well, you know, based on the Supreme Court decision, we're gonna roll Burson back to 15 weeks. And I'm like, I don't think that's gonna pass the, the Virginia Senate right now, but if there is a realignment of the Senate and the House stays where it is in, um, in the next go round in 2023, then you could find um, our abortion regulations changing. Um, I think this has to be the last question, and I wanted to get broader because I think this is kind of interesting. So uh, CJ Collins says, thought experiment e uh, equals th three things about that. Drop the filibuster, add more Supreme Court judges, and re-deliberate the issues. What do you think? So, I mean, you know, um, as a pragmatic matter, um, we had a um, president who, who wanted to remain president who basically sparked an insurrection and the result of which was it, it caused an attack on the Capitol. And I think anyone looking at the videos from that day can see that that was a completely horrible thing. And yet the people who were being attacked, I think we only got 57 votes in the Senate for impeachment, which was 10 shy of where they needed to be in order to in, impeach him. If you cannot impeach him for that action, it's going to be very hard to um, impeach. Uh, well, first of all, impeachment wasn't on the table. The question really was, can we can we over, overcome the filibuster and then, you know, can we expand the, the court? Um, and the answer is the votes are the votes are simply not there. Uh, presently, you've got uh, Kristen Sinema and you've got Joe Manchin who have said we're not going to undo the filibuster. 
And of course, the, you know, there, there are issues with that. If you undo the filibuster, if we have a Republican Senate, uh, you know, after these, these midterms, then you've, you've got a mess because then they can just go through, well, after 2024, if a Republican gets elected, then you have Republican House, Republican Senate, and Republican President, and they will just do whatever they want. Mind you, they could get to 2024 and say, hey, we're all in power and we're doing away with the filibuster and then go straight for, through and do whatever. Um, but there isn't the current will to do that. The other thing that I was thinking about, there's, there's two other strategies for the Supreme Court. And actually, I think impeachment of a couple, uh, AOC came out and she said, I think that um, certainly um, Kavanaugh and um, Gorsuch uh, misrepresented, and I think she used the word lied, which I'm comfortable with, lied about you know whether Roe was, was settled precedent that they, they wouldn't overturn. Uh, and, and I think lying during your confirmation hearings might be grounds for impeachment. But again, you're not going to get the votes over in the Senate for impeaching them because those are doing exactly what the base for those other 50 senators want to have done. Now, there is another approach. Congress controls the jurisdiction, what cases go to which courts. Congress has the ability to say all civil rights cases will now be heard by a new civil rights court. And they will not go to the Supreme Court instead. Well, I think, I still think you gotta get around the filibuster, but that could be done on majority votes. It doesn't take, a, it doesn't take the 67 votes that it would take for impeachment, but you still gotta get around the filibuster. And again, I don't think there's, I don't think there's any will to do that. I, I just wanna say to all of the people who are asking these questions, I'm as frustrated as you are. Um, I don't like what's happening. I have significant concerns for where our country is headed. And the only thing I can look at is and say, you know what? Pretty sure the people on the other side of these issues felt the same way when Lawrence was handed down, when uh, uh, Windsor was handed down, and when Obergefell was handed down. Um, I don't know what to do with that information. So I'm as perplexed as you are. And I appreciate the opportunity to worry out loud with you guys today about these things. Well, uh, we thank you for coming today. Uh, I was watching the numbers here. We had a, at a high 134 people and boy, people stayed with you through the whole thing, Michael. So, and you could see the level of questions and the energy in the questions, representing the questions. So I would like to thank you for coming today. And uh, I would also like to thank everybody that, that stayed with us and really was thoughtful in this discussion. It's a very frustrating discussion, but it, it's, it's good to worry together, I guess. You used the right phrase, you know, and to really get it out there. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. It's a little after 4.30. We will officially adjourn. We hope to see you in, on uh, July 11th to, uh, to, uh, to listen to uh, uh, a less controversial discussion about Asian art. So we will uh, we'll see you soon. Michael, thank you. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.